Uh, oh, thank you, John. Um, so it has become, I think, a bit of a tradition that uh, BAA talks kind of always come at the end of people's projects. But um, in the spirit of John Cannon's excellent paper um, a couple of months ago, I wanted to try a bit more of a work in progress um, rather than just talking about Sedenia, which as many of you have experienced uh, plenty of times. But in this case, it's kind of the beginning of a project. Uh, since the end of my PhD on Sedenia, I've been gathering photographs of the north and south elevations of the interiors and the exteriors of medieval parish church chancels. But only in the last few months have I really started to begin gathering them together. So this is a, a good time to do this talk, really. Um, and I've been also including measurements of length, width, and where possible height of the, um, the walls internally. And I currently have about 400, no, anyway, this is, what, this is what my desk looks like most of the times now, double monitor thing. And that was it this morning sort of thing, this sort of thing. And I have about 400 which I've uh, personally visited that I reckon are good enough evidence, you know, as medieval things. And they range from, you know, tiny red sandstone boxes in Cumbria to the famous decorated juggernauts. And this paper will really be just a trot through the development of this chancel as a genre and the features of the exterior and especially the interior that define it as a genre. And I really hope it generates as much comment at the end as it does question. And it should be about an hour if um, anyone's looking at their watch. But first, I'd just like to define the parts of my title. I can't remember whether it did have English in at the beginning, because, but it should. It should, the first part, English. And for me, England is defined by the English church, um, particularly at the time of the 1291 Taxatio, which is a very important uh, and useful document for me, not least because it's like bang in the centre of my period of interest in the 13th and 14th centuries. So therefore, Wales, because it's part of the Archdiocese of Canterbury, is within scope, but Scotland and Ireland are actually kind of out of my corpus area. They're useful for comparisons, but, you know, they're separate. And certainly while there's great variety within England, many of the traits I'll be talking about this evening are predominantly English ones. So, Paris Church. Now this one, this part of the title, might seem really straightforward. It's a church with a parochial function, a place for the general public to worship, or pastoral care perhaps, receive the sacraments. But it's easy to take the concept of every village having its own priest for granted. But the parish system is actually something that took a, you know, a good two centuries to become first, uh, firmly established. In the first millennium, um, I'm sure most of you would know, you have the Minster system, where villages were visited by priests operating out of a central community called the Minster. And the church was really just a venue for the pastoral care, and it would be very simple indeed, unless it had, you know, benefaction from the village to, you know, build it up into something, you know, more substantial. And it's in the 12th century that the idea of a parish looked after by a priest in charge called the rector really starts to develop. Now the rector was um, selected by a person, sometimes a religious institution, who held the right of advowson. And now they're commonly called the patron. And I do just want to mention quickly, well, when I, whenever you say patron in art history, it rings so many bells, but really the patron in this parish system, the only responsibility they have is to select the new rector. They don't have any you know, fabric maintenance or anything like that. Which doesn't sound like all that much, but it is actually quite an influential tool to be able to grant a priest who perhaps is from your family or from a family you're trying to you know, um, gain favour with, you know, the, the parish tithes. And this is a tax of which 10% of all the taxable income of the parish goes to his rectory. And in turn for this um, desirably steady and often quite significant income, we're talking like hundreds of pounds a year sometimes, um, the rector must make sure that his flock, obviously, have access to the sacraments. And of course, also a venue for it in the parish. And this is where we get to the next part of my title, the chancel. Chancel comes from the Latin 
cancelli, meaning screen. Therefore, this part of the church was defined by the fact that it was screened off from the rest of the building. And indeed, in medieval documents, it's this word that is often used to refer to it, while the rest of the building is actually just called the church. Now, Carol Crago has shown how, in the early part of the 13th century, it was established really through legal precedent of it coming up in <coughs> cases, and first mentioned in the Winchester Statutes of 1224, that while the parish was responsible for the upkeep of the church, that's the nave, the rector was responsible for the upkeep of the chancel. And I keep emphasising here responsibility. Now, while this, what was actually a distinctly English agreement, often led to the nave chancel separation that you see in these two places, so at um, Cly, you see that the chancel is outstripped by the height of the um, 14th century nave and transepts, but Bamborough, it's never um, equaled. Um, there's, there's nothing stopping lay people did, um, donating money to a chancel, or indeed rectors helping fund the whole church. It's only if it really does come down to the law that nobody wants to pay, then you know it's enforced. But it's this legal definition that makes the chancel more than just a name that we bestow on a typology of objects, like Victorian ecclesiologists, but it's a concept of actual presence and meaning in the Middle Ages. And that's why I think you have to sometimes be careful about what you use the word chancel for. I think it is a distinctly parochial concept because of this definition of chancel. And so calling the East Ends of Cathedrals, which Pevsner is really keen of doing, which really irritates me, I don't know if it irritates anyone else, is kind of incorrect and you know, it really parish churches. So the next bit of my title, uh, genre, well, this is something I'm borrowing a bit from Lit Crit, so don't worry, BA, I'll be quite brief with this. Um, for me, a genre is a series of works of art with a common function, but also a common repertoire of forms that help accentuate that function and make that function understood. So I have this slide of the old Royal Academy here, just for the metaphor of the hierarchy of the genres. If you wanted to be taken seriously as an artist in the 18th and 19th century, you had to paint history painting in the heroic mode. Now, this was a commonly agreed manner, but there's still scope for invention in that mode. But if you want to be understood as an artist, you need to conform to the you know, grammar of forms and, and rules and subjects. And this idea, I think, of period visual literacy is important. You do judge a book by its cover. You know what you're getting. It's not just the common subjects that unite these co the covers of these pulp sci-fi novels, but their treatment, their common fonts, their colours, and their compositions. And in a similar way, the exteriors of Paris church chancels are also <coughs> visually consistent, but endlessly variable. And I think that chancels, unlike the rest of the church, which are very complicated mixes of arcades, aisle walls, fenestrations, and clerestories of different dates, are relatively cohesive structures in English parish churches, which makes them an ideal object to study in this way. Yes, sure, a lot of them do have like bits of herringbone masonry in them, but overall, I think there are you know, a lot more consistent to look at. Now, the main attributes of the genre of the chancel will come when we look closely at the um, features of the interior. But the exterior is nonetheless interesting for how it's you know, distinctive and you can tell what you're looking at. So partly from the way that they were added to and maintained as spaces that are <coughs> essentially exclusively for the high altar and its ceremonies, they were rarely topped by clerestories and only later did they start to be commonly embraced by aisles. Uh, the exterior also often used big, tall, decorated buttresses as a key design feature, standing like flagstaffs to emphasize that part of the building's importance rather than just for um, sculptural necessity. And the east wall, by the 14th century, was commonly the place where you had the largest window in the church, the finest uh, display of tracery. And it's this big, flat east wall that does become, like it does in the great church as well, um, a big distinctive part of the form of the English chancel. So, is the chancel defined in sort of opposition to the rounded apse, that it's squared off to accommodate an altar against the, the east wall, and therefore this is the predecessor? Well, no, not quite. It's a 
bit more complicated than that. Now, Little Tay's small, unaisled outs building must have been considered good enough to contain the, its late medieval liturgy right up to the Reformation. So the apse, this apse would at some time in the 13th century probably started to be used as a chancel. But I, you know, I don't think it's right to say that it was originally. I do, I do like this slide because this isn't a selection, this is pretty much every semicircular apse left on a parish church in England. And, and it is a, it's always a question people think about is why did the multitudes of apses that we know were added to churches um, through uh, archeological investigation dwindle down to this by the Reformation. Yes, there were some apses that were apparently quite cruelly and um, needlessly squared off, such as poor old Melbourne here. Um, and it's very easy to look at a lot of chancels with Romanesque fabric in and think that an apse has been lobbed off, locked off, such as Adbaston here, where you see the east wall is entirely Gothic where you can see the masonry doesn't course and the plinth is different, and you, and you can see that the entire east wall is 14th century. However, I think it's likely that somewhere like Adbaston, they only replaced the east wall. If it actually had an apse or basically adding an extra bay, it would be an exceptionally long structure for a 12th century church. And it's not really controversial to suggest that because you can actually, if you, you don't have to look very hard to find a lot of medieval chancels that are essentially Romanesque two-celled square east ends. So you can see, you know, here you've got Romanesque windows surviving, Romanesque flat buttresses here, or of course even a straight-through vault. Even though it's been reconstructed, you can see that it's designed fully as it is. And I think there's been so much concentration on that small corpus of apses that not enough really thought has really been put on how these sort of Romanesque um, East Ends functioned in the village churches of the 11th and 12th century. Because of course if you go right back you can find square East Ends on the oldest English churches. Here's a uh, Wittering, uh, not only remarkable for its arch of Cyclopean crudity, but uh, also the survival of pretty much its entire Saxon West End, but without fenestration. So you can see long and short coins here and on the nave bit itself. Now, while the altar is up against the east wall now, doubtless as it was in the late Middle Ages, because they put um, a piscina in there, it almost certainly was not there when the church was built. Because all the evidence that we have for the position of the <coughs> altar in Anglo-Saxon churches, even though they might seem to conform to that familiar nave and a chancel plan, the archaeological evidence always points to the altar being at the east end of what we might think of as the nave, so the altar essentially in the church. So this is uh, Rome's Fernells, which is probably our best evidence for an Anglo-Saxon local church. And David Parsons argued at uh, this time that um, the eastern cell was far too small for any level of containing um, liturgical celebration, and instead it's probably, I think, better to compare its function more to that of a vestry, where the clergy would be before they sit to come forward to celebrate at the altar. Same thing with the reconstruction of the minster at Rakova, showing how the altar was not behind these triumphal arches as a threshold, but instead they are a backdrop to it. The apsidal area is no different to one of the side porticuses um, in being an, an adjunct space to the church proper. Now, I'd say perhaps the main difference that you get in 12th century churches is the proliferation of three cell plans, and um, these have been looked at quite well by um, Paul Barnwell, who's argued that in a church such as Kilpeck, although the altar is probably where the late medieval altar was in the apsidal cell, um, it was probably originally in the middle cell, particularly because it maximizes sight lines with the congregation. Um, I also think sometimes we do put a little bit too much on vaults, is that um, vaults are often used in um, 12th century churches, you know, to separate upper spaces and be able to separate floors. And just because you have a vault doesn't mean they're necessarily marking it off as a sacred space. 
So I don't think we should always think that the vaulted area is the most sacred area of the 12th century churches. Someone can talk about that later, maybe. But, um, but this is the thing. If you can imagine an apse functioning as an eastern cell behind a square third cell that contains the altar, so this is based on sort of Synthron and ideas, then it's not very hard to just transplant the same idea onto a square east end. In some ways, I, I think the apse is little more than a stylistic choice. It's not a simple diagnostic for the position of the altar. Therefore, when you, we return to Romanesque chancels, such as these two bay buildings, um, we can think of them instead as the two bay east end of a three cell um, conjunction of nave, altar bay, and chancel, and, uh, and vestry bit at the end, sorry. Um, and I bring up tick and coat here which I think emphasises how grand arches such as these aren't really marking a threshold like the mature 15th century rood screen, but they're emphasising an altar placed underneath or just a short distance behind it. However, there are some 12th century East Ends that do seem to be what we think of as chancels. This isn't necessarily because they have square East Ends and are quite long, but they all are, um, it's because they have the smoking gun of fragments of Piscina and Sedilia at the east ends of the south walls. Now, they all seem to be churches that, either by having lingering minster status or endowed um, with clergy by local munificence, they have relatively large numbers of priests present. Therefore, this change comes that you decide to swap the seating area in the apse with what you might think of a sort of collegiate seating, where you have extra benches for, cl for attending clergy in the west half at the east end, and then you have the seats for the officiating clergy by the altar. And this is really the beginning of the chancel. But what was exceptional in the 12th century became commonplace in the 13th century. East ends were extended commonly to about three bays long, while it, it was unusual to have a, it would be a sort of indication of minster or collegiate status at this time. Um, it would, you know, completely sort of change the way that the church operates in the village. And the point I really want to make is that the spread of the chancel and its furnishings is directly related to the consolidation of the parish system at the beginning of the 13th century, a new era of pastoral care and liturgical practice in the village church. And I think also the three bay thing is quite, this is just a bit of kite flying here, but when you've got a church such as Barfrestrum that is three bays long, although we don't have Piscina and Sedilia, Romanesque ones surviving in it, it's possibly a modif um, an indication that it might have been originally working as what we think of as a chancel because it is very late, of course. Anyway. Now, it's all very well to talk about all these sort of high flaunting ideas and that, but it really comes down, you can only make these things if you have the materials. In Northumberland, where the parishes are large and rectories, rectories wealthy, and of course there's masses of good stone, the frequent ambition we see at rendering these, this idea of the chancel at an early date is quite astonishing. Um, Bambra, we do actually kind of have a date for this because there's an Austin cell established there, whether it's established because it has a long chancel or in reaction to it, well, 1228 to date, you know, <laughs> I'm going to take what I can get. Um, but it's amazing how um, around all the parishes in the Wandsbeck Valley re region, a little bit further south, you do get a lot of relatively fancy chancels. They all have ashlar facing, car sedilia and piscina, and even a bit of wall articulation going on. And all pretty long, you see, around 15 metres. And then you go somewhere with a bit more mixed fortunes with building stone, like Wiltshire. There's a lot less ambition. You get shorter lengths. And it's interesting here, Stockton, which is the only one that uses ashlar, is essentially only one bay long, a really tidy chancel. Uh, but None of them have Sedilia, even the Prebendal Church, um, only Piscina, the bare essentials, really. And in places with like no good available stone, like the London clay beds in Essex, 13th century chancels 
as indeed ions are, um, are rare, and the idea and the chancels don't really establish until the 14th and 15th century, and a lot of churches in you know, southern East Anglia must have gone with their Romanesque apses serving as chancels for you know, quite, a f quite a few centuries. Now, the important thing about size, like the addition of nave ions, is it's not necessarily straightforwardly correlated with increasing parish populations. Now, about populations and how it might affect sizes of churches, um, particularly the chancel, it's a difficult one because access to the chancel is quite a complicated topic, which is a paper to itself. But let's just say here that dioceses and archdeacons are very keen on making sure that during mass, no one is to be present in the chancel except for clerics and other esteemed person, such as the advowson holder, because the chancel was really strictly for one thing, for the high altar and its ceremonies. And I'm saying the word ambition a lot when I'm talking about big chancels such as these. These are both around 18 metres long, uh, the same size as Bamborough, um, but even taller walls, actually. Um, and they probably receive such, such ambitious buildings due to their status as prebends, which is one place the, that um, uh, prelates do like to seem to spend their money on in parish churches. And this makes them architectural paradigms in a way. And they, off and they seem to set a, a, an example to other parishes around them that really does allow for the spread of the idea. And this early ambition, it is interesting how many 13th century chancels did seem big enough for the rest of the Middle Ages. Uh, note the amount of 13th century chancels we can see today, but these ones are ones that uh, the lancets have just been opened up a bit and some tracery put in, and they serve perfectly well as a 14th century chancel. However, you do get some extension in um, the, the High Middle Ages. Uh, see the doubling of Rotherfield here, and at Clifton Campville in the 1360s, where a chancel, and usually with a um, South Isle arcade, gets an extra bay added onto it. And in this case, it does seem because this church does have collegiate ambitions that were um, never fulfilled. Um, and of course, the, when we get to the really big ones, uh, at 27 metres, Winchelsea might seem like it was utterly overambitious. And perhaps it was. The nave certainly was never built. Um, and probably the medieval chancel only really ended up being like two bays of the central vessel. But there are parish churches that were built that have even longer chancels than these. Uh, oh, yeah, that, that's just uh, the raw list of them. But here's a slightly more whittled down one. Uh, Newcastle, bit of a boring church, but massive chancel. Um, that's the longest one I have so far. Other, obviously, Hull, like when Chelsea, Royal Church, um, Newark, and St. Boto, I think, is the longest unaisled one. And I'll be talking a little bit about aisle chancels right at the end and the problems that uh, they have for um, thinking about chancels. And of course, not all chancels were huge. Um, obviously, those small Saxon and Norman East Ends that were so lucky to have if you work on the early stuff, um, were made into small late medieval chancels. But you do come across quite a lot of late medieval square east ends, presumably because either they had to rebuild really dilapidated Romanesque ones, or in the case of Warren Percy, because the value of the rectory had dwindled so much that they just couldn't afford to maintain a larger building. Anyway, let's move now to the interior. Because it is remarkable after the variety of the 12th century and how difficult it is to understand liturgical function in Romanesque buildings, how consistent and legible the liturgical fixtures are in English parish church chancels in the 13th and 14th century. So much I uh, did this nice diagram of the ideal chancel with all of the features labelled, which I'll sort of go through. And it's always kind of hard to get started talking about the bits of um, medieval chancels, because the most important bit, the raison d'etre of every chancel, 
its beating heart, was ripped out. And I don't think that it's an exaggeration to say that during the Edwardian Reformation, every single high altar was pulled down. All you really get for altars are surviving ones, are ones in obscure subsidiary places, so the crypt at Grantham, and uh, I think Alan Barton for sharing this one hidden away in a sacristy in a Lincolnshire church. And uh, of course, many altar menses were recovered, perhaps some of them in the Marine period when they were swiftly removed again, and often in the ecclesiological and antiquarian eras. But uh, they do remain controversial. Uh, Church of England in a nutshell there, Catholic uh, house mender on top of a wooden communion table. Um, and even in the Victorian period, they didn't really like putting stone altars back some, sometimes. But it's altar menses themselves are not particularly interesting. You see how simple medieval altars are. They are basically just a consecrated slab um, up on some breeze blocks and presumably some relics underneath that uh, they would have had to use um, to have the altar consecrated. But uh, it's the decoration that would have been around the altar, such as altar pieces and all those other sorts of things beloved by art <coughs> historians. But I think it is really incredible that we probably know more about great church high altars and their setting than we do about parish church ones. So we know about like, you know, Exeter and its big spiral um, and its big spiralettes and canopies and that go on to like Peterborough and Durham. And then you've got the wall type <coughs> rarebuses that you get at St. Albans and Winchester. But um, there are probably more of these, not relatively, but absolutely in great churches than there are in parish churches. To come across something like this in Geddington that really doesn't look very much, and you probably wouldn't really give it a, a second thought because you'd think it was Victorian, but the niches here um, that presumably would have originally contained statues are original and actually even better that we actually have an inscription <coughs> dating the um, installation of these in the chancel. Um, because so often when we look at a chancel, um, there's been so much damage done to that terminal east wall because it's the focus of you know, the church. Um, it's such a controversial space. Um, and a church such as Lawford, which is really one of my favorites, and I'm, I'm always going to try and find a way to get it into a presentation where you've got all these side windows that have wonderful carving of vine trails and acrobats and owls. Um, you really, it's like looking at a medieval manuscript with the text um, burnt out and just the marginalia around the edge left because the entire east wall was basically when the high altar was pulled off it was made good in which it means that they smashed anything of interest off it and covered it up with, um, with boards and took the east window out and that sort of thing. So the most common place for the altar does seem to have been flush with the east wall, and we've very often lost um, any imagery associated with it. But one of the few bits of imagery that does, or indications of imagery that survives, are the patron and virgin niches that would have been either side of the altar. Um, now, the first time we know about this, that it's documented, and I always forget which way around it is, but I've got it up there now, so I can remember. So the patron is supposed to be on the south side and the Virgin Mary on the north. And this is first documented in the Chapel of Peter um, ad vincula in the tower in um, the mid 13th century. And then it starts to crop up in a lot of parish uh, church statutes from dioceses in the 14th century that you've got to have these two figures. And it does seem to be de rigueur to have them. Of course, not many of them survive um, some, obviously some wall paintings managed to survive because either they were whitewashed or covered up with um, commandment boards. Uh, incidentally, this is probably about the only time it's worthwhile me putting the dedication on because this does explain why you've got the Madonna and Child on one side, you have three female saints on the other side that stand for all saints. And when you start looking for these patron virgin niches, you do sit, start seeing um, quite a lot of them. And the variation in the sizes of them is quite interesting. Sometimes you've got 
a bigger virgin niche, and sometimes you've got an absolutely massive patent niche, like here. And um, this may be, of course, because of surviving images through the church's life that were kept from earlier chancels, as well as local patterns of worship and belief. And there's also the interesting problem, and about, of course, another time that's a rare time that dedications are interesting. Um, if you've got a church dedicated to St. Mary, um, you see here there was almost certainly an image of the Virgin Mary um, between these two angels, the statue. And on this side, you have the very strange image of a harrowing of hell that David Parker shown was um, uh, donated by a late 14th century rector. Because if your patron is Mary, then you can't have her on both sides. So obviously that was a blank space for quite a while until uh, filled in. So, how do we know where the altar is? Well, I've given it away by not, um, by not hiding those two arrows. Well, as I've, as I've indicated before, it really is the liturgical furnishings of the Piscina and Sedilia that help us locate that disappeared altar. So, it was considered vital that every chancel have a Piscina, Sacrarium Lapideum, is mentioned in, again, those diocesan statutes for parish churches because they were really vital to the core belief in transubstantiation, which is one of the things that really did fuel the development of the chancel as this larger venue for the Eucharist. Now, I'm sure all of you know what a piscina is and have had a good poke around in them, but I still think it's useful to go over exactly what they're for. After the Eucharist, the rinsings of the chalice, the pattern, and the priest's fingers made their way into a big bowl called a lava, and the contents of which you can hardly just like chuck out window. You, you need to dispose of them in a, um, a comely way. And so the piscina really is just simply a convenient disposal hole for sacred leftovers. Uh, I think sometimes people think of them more as like a washing up sink, but you know, you're only just pouring stuff down them. You have all of the like, water that's infused with actually God himself, and you need to have a way to get rid of it. Now, technically, these things do seem to be very simple. They're essentially a drain hole in the thickness of the wall, and that's why you have a niche in, in, um, that goes into the thickness of the wall down through the wall core and into the earth below the church. There's no pipe or anything like that that uh, church wardens always seem to be obsessed with trying to find when I talk to them. Um, but since you do find a lot of piscinas in monasteries that have been ripped out to the floor, uh, that, one's, that one's been ripped out a bit, but that one used to be ripped it out right to the floor. And of course, monasteries are different to parish churches in that they did become secular possessions that people wanted to get every last bit of money out of them, including every last bit of metal. And whether they're pulling out lead plumbing here, and whether there's any lead plumbing in parish church piscinas, if anyone's got a metal detector and they want to go poking around in piscinas, then it would be interesting to have a look at, but that's just a, an interesting. Now, usually, because of the wear and tear of pouring water down these drains, um, the drain itself is rarely reliable evidence. It usually has a new drain um, or indeed just turns into a shelf in the 19th century. But there are some legitimate survivals of quite fancy ones with um, quite awkward looking uh, drains actually. <coughs> now, a lot of early piscinas are often double piscinas. And the double piscina is a type that becomes progressively rare through the 13th and 14th centuries. And no one has ever really been able to find a good, accurate, documentary or liturgical reason for why this is. And indeed, I think this is because there's no liturgical reason to need to use two drains simultaneously. I would say that these early piscinas were double because they could be. And it's before the spread of Sedilia, they were often the only, mur the only mural furnishing in the chancel. So making them more prominent by doubling them was indeed desirable. And of course, having two drains is useful 
if one gets blocked. So at least you can dispose of the Eucharist and then be like, oh God, I know what Muggin Zoo is doing on Sunday afternoon. I've got to unblock the Pashina drink, you know. Um, so it's always useful to have more. But when Sedelia become combined with Pashinas from an early date in the 13th century, the Sedelia were all sorts of shapes and sizes. But when the um, design of the Sedelia um, normalizes at the end of the 13th century, um, Pichina are more commonly incorporated into the same design, which kind of makes the need to create a larger double Pichina feature obsolete. So, but anyway, back to the Pichina, because, because the ablutions of the Eucharist were indeed so precious, perhaps arguably more than any um, saintly relic, because it is God himself, um, it's a good idea to have the Pichina obviously as close to the altar as possible because if you end up spilling it on the way then you've got a really big task of having to you know burn things and get rid of it and that sort of thing so it's a good indication exactly how far the east, the high altar was so what can looking at pashinas define the position of the high altar suggest well i did get a bit obsessed at one point about trying to see how many churches may have had screens behind the altar that kind of turned the theatre performance into having sort of a backstage. Um, one of, apart from of course cathedrals where you get these sorts of things all the time, the finest one is in Wales in Clanwick Major, which uh, I visited with the BAA actually, and of course that means you can look behind it which, and it's not very interesting, don't worry, <laughs> not missing anything. Um, but uh, otherwise, I'm, you really do have difficulty finding examples of these. Probably the best one, again, BAA Norwich 2012, uh, Blakeney has a surviving early 14th century altar screen inserted into a 13th century chancel. Now, again, being in the VA is useful because you can see behind. And there's usual niches and places to keep things and uh, what you would expect in this small sort of um, sacri vestry space. The only other really comparable example, though, to Blakeney is Warfield, which I went to a couple of weeks ago um, after wanting to go for it for um, quite a long time in Berkshire, where you have the beautiful um, circa 1300 leaf carving of the Sedina and Pashina that were best, the best evidence that Street had to reinstate this altar screen um, across the, the um, probably about the last half bay of the chancel. Now he did have apparently good archaeological evidence for reinstating this. But nevertheless, basically all the carving of that is indeed 19th century, but not the Stelia. And of course then you've got a space behind that leads to a door that allows access <coughs> to a stair turret where the Sanctus bell was kept. Now, those of you who are familiar with Blakeney will remember that Blakeney also has the Sanctus bell turret. And then <coughs> I really struggle to find any more extant ones. This is one I found this summer. This is not in a chancel, it's actually in the north chancel aisle. Um, and I think I only put this in because you go behind, you've got all the bits of gardening rubbish, and you've got a door, which doesn't lead outside, but it leads to a stair turret. So <laughs> it is um, amazing, I think, how the very small corpus of altar screens all seem to be related to stair turrets. Um, so, but I am still kind of looking, I still have bits of evidence um, for thinking of altars, uh, thinking of altar screens in particularly large chancels. I have a few more examples, but I thought I'd just, just keep this one. If you've been to Cobham, you'll know that you've got a 13th century double Pashina, which uh, still retains its original paint that I just showed a few slides ago. And then you've got the Henry Eveley um, Pashina and Sedelia in the last bay. And I think that it's um, a good working theory that originally this Pichina served a high altar in front of an altar screen that screened off the last bay of this enormous chancel as a vestry. And then when it becomes collegiate, they don't need it anymore. 
they cover up the piscina, that's why the paint survives, and install new sedilia and a new piscina. But it's very difficult to see how common it was, because a lot more common for the position of the sacristy is on the north side. Now, sacristies are something I've, um, in just working up this paper, was something that I got uh, <laughs> very interested in. And um, I'll go into how they are indeed really quite potentially very interesting, but also extremely troublesome objects. Because um, these sort of sacristies are extremely rare indeed, where they're decorated to um, the same level as the chancel and are clearly built at the same time as it. And Hecton has you know, wonderful pinnacles and decoration just to the same degree as the chancel. Um, and Nantwich is really the only um, similar example I really have at the moment for a sacristy that's, you know, like a cathedral one almost. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to go into <laughs> Heckington recently, actually, um, with the um, very friendly HLF team. Um, and you'll see that in the um, sacristy you have another double piscina, because um, there's another double piscina in the chancel, but of course it's... it's or you can never have too many piscina drains, I think, in an emergency. Uh, and underneath you have a vaulted undercroft, although it should be admitted that that vault is entirely 19th century, and we were not quite sure whether it actually was there originally. There's no, there's no indication of a medieval one, so I'm not sure. I have not been able to see inside Nantwich, um, <laughs> and I've asked the obvious person, but if anyone else has been inside Nantwich Sacristy, I'd be very interested to know what's inside there. Um, so sacristies are nearly always on the north side of the altar, uh, on the north side of the chancel, and their position is actually though quite variable. Usually they're on the north east corner. Sometimes though they're in the middle. You can see the original gable scar on Offington, and sometimes they are on the westernmost bay. Now. A lot of the time they do seem to have been extensively rebuilt. You can see there's a massive amount of brick in Frampton there, and you can see that Malpass is, you know, interestingly, entirely Georgian. And this is because they do seem to have been certainly made to a less quality than the chancel itself, and a lot of them were indeed demolished. And that's useful because the problem about sacristies is that in an open, when you go visiting churches, usually open churches, the only bit they will lock is the sacristy. You have to go to great lengths to get a church ward and say why you want to go into the usual private like priest's office, and then you go in and there's nothing there. So when they've been demolished, at least you can see the giveaway of the blocked up door, which you can obviously see better on the inside, and that there's a piscina inside. And I got really interested in these sacristy star scars and started collecting them, where you can always see characteristically the, um, the rubble core um, that, would, that shows that it wasn't originally supposed to be an external wall, a piscina, and the blocked up door. So what's interesting about these, though, is if you note these, these churches with sacristies, the interior of these chancels all have the piscina bang up against the east wall, so that there's certainly no room for an altar screen. So at least that does work. So one of my things will be trying to work out about um, correlation between sacristies and altar, and, altar, and uh, piscina position. And there's a lot of other things going on that's interesting in sacristies, you know, two-story ones that in some ways you could say that they're probably like cathedral ones that you have a sacristy and a treasure house in one building, but there's also indication in a lot of these sort of buildings that they were at least temporary dwellings for priests, maybe a few overnights, not maybe their, their full-time lodgings, but certainly that they would be used for, for living in, partly. And sometimes they are actually incredibly small as well. Um, this church in Essex, you think this is a niche, on this side of the chancel. But originally it does seem to have been a door that goes to this kind of small cupboard space on the north side. And here's one as well, um, uh, the, the near the um, Worcestershire border, 
Now it looks like you would expect there'd be a tomb on the inside of here, but I assure you there is nothing. Um, but you can see how thick the wall is, that it might have again been a sort of cupboard space for a, for a, for a small sort of sacristy area. And the other thing I'd like to point out about parish church sacristies is how consistently they are on the north side. These two that are on the south side are very rare exceptions indeed. Uh, there are a lot of, of course, modern sacristies and vestries that are given faculty and they're often allowed to be clamped onto the <coughs> original priest door, which we'll talk about last, but actually legitimate medieval ones, I found very little evidence for ones on the north side, which is interestingly a rare case of parish churches being more symbolically consistent than great churches. And some other ones with them on the south side here. These are all the ones that are big and approaching sort of almost cathedral scale. Even though they're still conforming to parish church two-story elevations, they are unusually lavish buildings and usually large buildings. And there are a handful as well of them on the east end. Obviously, St. Peter Mancroft in Norwich is, is one that um, comes up to mind, but uh, surviving one at Lavenham, a 15th century one clamped on the end of a 14th century chancel, and uh, the surviving doors at this church in Lincolnshire. Oh, oh yes, and not a controversial <laughs> one at all. Um, Easter sepulchral niches. Um, a lot of the time, I'm sure, on you've noticed there are large, wide, sort of basically they look like tomb niches on the north sides of chancels. They usually don't contain effigies, and if they do, they contain a later effigy that's been moved there, or in this case, I think you can uh, see that this one is slightly later than uh, the 14th century because he's got an enormous Edwardian moustache and a friendly dog at his feet. Um, but this one, I think, is even more interesting that you see how they are, these niches were kept free of a statue effigy. This one in Frampton has the brass matrix of a priest. And the reason they wanted to keep these niches flat was because it's commonly accepted that these niches were used to contain the Easter sepulchre chest at, um, in the Paschal Liturgy. Um, and this is fair enough. The, I'm, I'm not bothered by this at all because there are loads of wills dated from the mid 14th century and then absolutely loads in the early 16th century that, that basically say, I would like my body buried on the north side of the chancel so the sepulchre could be placed on it at Easter. That's pretty transparent. Even in material objects, we start getting you know, types of tomb that look more like Easter sepulchre consoles than they do sarcophaguses. The problem is that this textual link, this evidence, has come to the um, conclusion of any sort of niche at all, uh, any sort of fixture on the north side of the chancel being called an Easter sepulchre. Most notably this small but important group of objects, some of which were by the same group of masons, some of which weren't. Now, although um, Veronica Seculis really kind of did solve this in the 80s, there's still this um, lingering thing of calling these Easter sepulchres, when instead they are much more closely related to the sacrament shrine and the tomb of Christ. And the practical arguments really, I think, as well as adding to the intellectual arguments that uh, Veronica did, and this has also been expanded on quite a lot um, by a least recent PhD at uh, Leicester by Christopher Herbert, um, that the Paschal Liturgy for Depositio and Elevatio seems to have involved placing an altar cross down, flat down, as if it's buried. Now you try getting a cross into some of these. Some of them it's possible with, but somewhere like Horton it is like evidently not really practical at all, particularly because you've got that small um, little niche there that's much more suited for reservation of the host all year round. And I think that's really the second and main reason, is that I can't see how you can have something so fabulous like this installed in a chancel opposite the Sedelia and only bring yourself to use it once a year. It's really too prominent. 
And it gets even worse that any niche, however small, on the north side of the chancel is supposed to be in use for only three days a year. And then you get like even smaller niches that still get labeled Easter sepulchres, even though like that one there at uh, Cold Overton is probably just, um, <laughs> you know. And I think this is where though, when we actually try and think what is that thing at Cold Overton for, that this idea of genre can sort of run out of steam. Because when it comes to it, art historians are always trying to reduce the physical object uh, to text. Um, and while we can comfortably align our word chancel um, with that of the Middle Ages, um, when we get to these sort of things, we get to, as Paul Binsky recently said, genres of a very fluid kind. Um, and while it's wrong to call these, I think, Easter sepulchres, it's also wrong to label them with some pseudo-ecclesiological word like ombres. Um And that's why I'm trying to like record things with basically straightforward descriptions of you know how many niches there are and plain niches and decorated niches, not to always call them Easter sepulchre niches and ombres. Obviously, Pashina, because we can see the function of those. Sedelia, we can see the function of those. These, well, oh yeah, that does that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> good, isn't it? Um, that there are weird niches um, all over the place um, in, in parish church chancels, and they may have had multiple functions. They may have had a function that nobody found they really needed and then they changed function, they may have never been put in for no particular function because we all know you can never have too many cupboards to put things in. Uh, so anyway, oh yeah, these things. Well, I used to be skeptical about these, but I've recently uncovered so much documentary evidence that I can't deny it any longer. That no, the, oh, the idea that these features that you often see in the bottom uh, corner of uh, the south side of um, chancels were like giving out the most precious object of Christendom like ice cream to um, lepers uh, is one of those absurd things that people still suppose is actually plausible. I mean, never mind that the laity rarely took communion uh, and that there was also ways for the sick and infirm to receive communion like leper chapels where, you know, um, that these things and uh, Paul Balmer has shown this very well. Um, are better referred to as low side windows. And they seem to have been primarily for, again, not very interesting, but ventilation. When you've got all these candles and incense going, the oxygen could get rather low, at which time a clerk sitting by the chancellage could crank open the low side window. So here's another one here that has some modern shutters on it that sort of show you that thing. And I think that one way of thinking about them and why they developed is that originally in Norman churches and Saxon churches as well, you wouldn't have had glazing, you would have had small windows that would have had shutters, so you could have opened them. When you start getting big windows with stained glass, you couldn't open them, so you needed to be able to open a window. It, it really does make more sense when you think about it. Make more sense than leper squints anyway, but uh, <laughs> sometimes it's very hard to shift those sort of um, things. Oh yes, and then the last sort of thing I'll talk about is the mysterious sort of western half of the chancel. Um, so as I've said, during the celebration of mass, parishioners were not admitted into the chancel, except perhaps the lord of the manor if he was the patron, or a visiting dignitary such as you know the monarch would be able to perhaps. But. Uh, Parish church chancels these days are full of all sorts of junk, right? Um, oh dear me, uh, radiators and all of the organs and things that you don't need. And that's why you really got to put stuff like this out of your mind, uh, a lay surplus choir with lay people sitting in the chancel. So um, actually finding proper medieval choir stalls in parish church chancels is extremely rare. Now, it was uh, Donald O'Connell at the King's Lynn BAA transactions who um, wrote up very well how most of these stalls that you find in parish church chancels are actually brought in at the buyer's market of the Reformation, and they're from dissolved monasteries, and not indicative 
of parochial furnishing. Of course, you do get actual parochial stalls. These are probably the earliest ones in Clifton Campville. That, again, this is that church that did seem to have um, aspirations to become collegiate. But uh, they're, they're very rare indeed, and certainly don't let date before the 14th century. Now, since there were probably not that non-officiating clerical attendees in non-collegiate foundations, although the later we go, probably the more chantry priests we can expect who could uh, sit in the chancel, the seating in the west half of the chancel was probably very simple indeed. And I wrote about the documentary evidence for this in the JVAA, um, the documentary evidence for what, what they very confusingly in the Middle Ages called sedilia, very simple benches, but not the sedilia that we think of. And uh, one of the, uh, I think, indications for the, ma the material appearance of these are these stone arms that you occasionally find in parish churches rather unconvincingly reassembled as throne-like sedilia. But you can sometimes find them in chancels, enclosing um, stone benches, wall benches, um, often surrounded by Victorian furniture, so they're quite hard to spot. And so it would really seem that the western half of the chancel, uh, which for convenience I, I do term the choir, um, was actually really rather free of furniture. And indeed this, having an empty buffer zone, was surely part of the grandeur of an ambitious chancel, that you're embracing space, so you're not generally just filling it with stuff because you can. So I come up with my, the last part of the uh, chancel, uh, the priest door, um, to, whoops, to um, accentuate uh, this. Uh, priest doors, not um, the most uh, interesting feature of the chancel. Occasionally they're decorated. It's interesting how the earlier ones tend to be at the west end, and later it's very rare indeed to have them at the west end. Because I think the most useful thing about priest doors is how they demarcate the transition between the carved furnishings of the sanctuary, so the sedilia and piscina and other niches, and then the plain dados of the rest. So you can see, oh that, yes, so that's where the priest door is, because they often have those uh, curtains uh, hung in front of them. Perhaps people are good at spotting those. So you can see at a church like Nantwich, collegiate, but with a parochial function, um, that the priest, uh, that the choir stalls, original choir stalls, fit neatly in the space between the, the priest door and the chancel arch, oh, well, the uh, end of the tower. So you think maybe at a grand um, place like Sandiacre, um, would what is going on in that last bit of the chancel? Is this um, which was uh, pro this chancel that was probably built by the Bishop of Lichfield in his short tenure as, as of prebend holder here, 1342 to 7, are they just building a big chancel that doesn't really have any aspirations to holding that many clergy? It's just big because it, because it wants the grandeur. Okay, so I'm just going to finish on a few problems, really, that uh, still come up, and that you've probably been thinking of as well, that I just want to get out. The first one is chancel aisles. Um, you can see here this is Oakham in Rutland and you have the three piscinas of the three sanctuaries all next to each other. Sometimes you'll even get three sets of sedilia next to each other which is really quite amazing when you think that you would actually have three solemn masses going on at the same time. It seems quite absurd and the main question I would have about this, um, as well as like side chapels that are almost as big, if not bigger, than the chancel, and, and indeed lady chapels, um, or so we call them. Uh, the um, Barnack one is actually documented as a lady chapel, and indeed it has a statue. They even have statue niches. Are these, even though they are past the chancel arch, counted as part of the chancel fabric? Or are there certain agreements that make sure that these parts are separate? 
are chancel aisles part of the chancel in legalistic terms, in fabric maintenance terms? And the other big problem about fabric maintenance and the, what a chancel would have been is central towers. Um, oh, that's another one. Um, so at a church like Fifield here, which has essentially a one bay chancel on the end of the central tower, but you can see it's got modern choir stalls in it, and you would assume that the tower space would be used as the choir. But if the rood screen or the, the divider was actually on the west side of the tower, then that means the rector is responsible for the tower and the bells and all the stuff that goes along with that. What, what would the, where, when you've got a central tower, is that counted as part of the chancel? Now, I did just spend uh, a week in uh, Lincolnshire looking at uh, four crossing tower churches, um, Bicker, Sutterton, Algerkirk, and the fragment at Curtin in Holland, and none of them really had clear evidence where the root screen was, which was a little bit <laughs> annoying. But here, um, Hertfordshire, Wheat, Hampstead, so this is the east side of the tower, and you can see the screen would have been on this side, which uh, means that the parish would have been responsible for the tower. And Fairford, an interesting building actually, if you actually go to it, um, that you can see the rood screen, which is original, is actually on the east side of the tower that again makes the, um, the central tower into a church space. So, hang on, I lost my text. So, just to um, conclude, a common thread that winds through any sort of investigation of something like this is the sense of loss. So, a chancel such as Ratliff, Crackcliffe Cooley here that has no sacristy, no priest door, not even a piscina, <coughs> might seem like an impenetrable oddity for um, a modern ecclesiologist. And perhaps it will remain so, because with our long reformation, that uh, really did tear things apart from 1534 to 1660, we can't think of absence of evidence being evidence of absence. I mean, no chancel will be a complete document of the medieval past, but I think as a whole, the genre is indelibly connected with the mature medieval parish church, and it's rich enough to reveal some of the lost fittings and forgotten functions of these buildings. Thank you. Thank you.